And I think the immigrant mentality slang for like some sort of mix of ambition and really a, almost like a form of lack of complaining and or a mix of gratitude. There is incredible advantages of being an immigrant in a place of opportunity like America. And what I mean by that is there are plenty of seventh generation Americans listening right now that have full accountability, don't complain, tremendous ambition, incredible tenacity. But there's one very big truth in human life, which is it's hard to be hungry when you're fed. And you know, for me, it's very clear, it's not hard to analyze. When I was 12 and I wanted things, and I had already at the age of 12 entered the zone where my mother felt that she didn't need to buy things for me, that if I wanted them, I should go get it. You can imagine selling lemonade or baseball cards or whatever I had to do. Shoveling snow was a big activity of mine. Washing cars was a big activity of mine. May she rest in peace. I lost a friend that I grew up with, Marissa Bird. Makes me a little emotional, but like, we fucking, Robbie Turnick, I know you're watching too right now, Andy Greco, my little sister Liz, we fucking hoses on our, like like real hoses, not like, like you know, back when they made them well, like wrapped on our shoulders, like bucket of water, like we grinded because we grew up in an environment where like, like mommy and daddy, we're not gonna buy you things at Toys R Us. Like if we wanted bazooka from Krausers, like we needed to find that five cents and it, of course that became a humongous advantage. And how did that, change the way you dealt with money. Like my family just used cash. I also have found that regardless of where your family's from, nobody used the dishwasher. Did you use the dishwasher? <laughs> we didn't even have one. Like I, we grew up very, like just to remind everybody, cause I know there's probably a lot of people here watching that don't have a lot of context of me. Like I was born in the Soviet Union. When we moved to Queens to immigrate to America, we, we lived in a studio apartment with multiple family members, five, six, seven, depending on what was going on, because there was three studios. Like, we were really poor. Not like, we weren't lower. Like a lot of people like talk about, oh, I grew up humbly, and what they're saying, thank God, this is a wonderful thing. We're in a prosperous country. They mean they grew up middle class. Like they didn't have a BMW. Like we grew up, like I, now, to my dad's credit, we weren't dirt poor for very long. We were dirt poor, and then we moved to Dover in like a, a little bit better situation. And then we grew, then I mainly grew up in a townhouse in Edison, New Jersey, which was a blue collar, lower middle class neighborhood. And so we didn't have a dishwasher. Like I remember thinking a dishwasher was like, that was status. I remember thinking, as old as 14 years old, which would be 1989, I remember thinking that if you had a BMW or a Mercedes, that would be equivalent to the way we look at the Kardashians today. Like private plane, yachts, Elon Musk, Bezos. Like to me, if you had a Mercedes or a BMW, you were filthy, filthy rich. So my relationship with money though is very fascinating in hindsight, which I think, and you'll probably know this better than I, so I'm almost asking you this question. I got really lucky and fortunate that I don't have a relationship with money where I view it as validation. I don't hoard it. I definitely don't weaponize it. I view it as a byproduct of the thing I really love, which is the game. Winning. Winning. But I also love losing. Tell me more. Well, I think entrepreneurship's interesting to me. Like, I think about this a lot. I love winning, but I equally get great joy in losing. Another great podcast like yours I did where I finally broke it down was Steve Bartlett's podcast. I got a lot of emails about this. I talked about this thing that happens to me. It actually just happened uh, a couple weeks ago where I was still at 48 play pickup basketball and you shoot for teams. And sometimes if you shoot for teams, instead of just mixing up teams, if there's 10 guys there, and you're like, okay, let's make this kind of even, you're tall, you're tall, you guys split, you're good, you're good, you stink, you stink, like, you know, which is common. We always shoot for teams. And sometimes when you shoot for teams, the teams are obnoxiously lopsided. And I especially get excited when my team is much worse. And, and I really weirdly like when we lose the first game, 11 to two. 
something chemically triggers into me where I get really excited about it. It's kind of like the, the it's, it's nothing like too wild other than like, can we have the intestinal fortitude? <laughs> can we have the chemistry amongst ourselves? Can we be clever or figure something out to somehow now win the next game? And sometimes the teams are very lopsided. You get your ass kicked again and can. And I just talked about in this podcast like how I get enjoyment out of that. And it's similar to business. I don't get devastated when agendas, investments, concepts, strategies, or even companies I start fail. I view it as that's the price of admission. I don't feel entitled that because I have been historically successful that I'm allowed to be successful in the next thing I do. And weirdly, I like when I fail because it allows me to talk to myself of like this fun relationship of like, see Big Shot? Like this fucking game doesn't give a fuck about you. This is real merit shit and you weren't good enough. I like that. It's kind of like the podcast ratings. I've been doing it for a long time and it ebbs and flows, right? When, when I heard there was an opportunity to do the show with you, I was pumped because we hadn't seen each other in a while. And then, you know, during that process, I was like, oh, and I got to see how well the show's doing. And that makes me so happy for you. What I liked about that was when I looked at it, that was the first time I had looked in a long time. And I got to see a lot of people that have been doing it for a long time and a lot of people that are merging. And you see, and you know this because you do this for a living, over the last 10 years, there's been like just a lot of ebbs and flows. Like there was multiple years where my podcast was in the top 100 consistently overall. That is not where I am now and I think I deserve that because I know that I'm not putting everything into my podcast right now because I'm putting into other things. I like that. I I feel like you do deserve to be where you are and you're right because you're doing it. And I I don't know, I'm obsessed with merits. why I love sports. Like you can talk anything you want, but they're gonna play tonight, a tennis match is gonna happen, a basketball game's gonna happen, and everybody can talk, but the game's gonna play out and the game's gonna be the game. And business is the closest thing to that. I like that there's merit in it, and I don't want to only like the game for what I get out of it. I wanna love the game for the game. And then, because that's my obsession, yes, I got fortunate, my passion wasn't painting, it wasn't singing, it wasn't gardening or golfing. My passion was entrepreneurship. The byproduct, if you're good at that, is there is economic upside. No different, by the way, than if you're a remarkable athlete or actress or things of that nature. But I find a lot of people that grow up with little become overly obsessive and have a very unhealthy relationship with money. They use it as a makeup or a band-aid to close up feelings that they had from that era. I grew up in a very fortunate environment, which was, we didn't have a lot of money, but I was happy all the time, because my mother was such a supernova. So I was one of those lucky people who learned that money isn't the anecdote to happiness. And I actually believe the people that are most happy in the world are the ones who don't grow up with a lot and grew up with extreme happiness, because they're taught from day one, there is no correlation to happiness and money, and I'm very grateful for that someone who I reopened, reopened, meaning an investment was closed, it was done. I went to bat for this person, to the founder, to reopen the round and let them put $50,000 in, or 100, I don't remember, an investment. The company went on to have a massive exit. This person made heavy eight figures. And when I went and asked for a book buy, they bought none and ghosted me. And I remember, that being a really exciting moment for me because it was when I was able to call my bluff on myself. I genuinely mean what I'm about to say. I've continued to have a relationship with this person, like, you know, later on. I genuinely don't judge the person because my brain goes to, maybe they were busy. I asked, by the way, I asked four times because I knew I made this person lots and lots of money. I was like, this guy can buy 500 copies, you know, like I really knew. I'm so grateful and thankful for my parenting, my DNA, my circumstance. The fact that I have no real feelings against that. I just only know how to deploy optimistic compassion, right? Maybe he was in a bad place, maybe, I don't know. Who am I to judge? And don't forget, here's the big key to this, Nicole, and I hope this lands for people. I was asking. When you ask, you're not allowed to judge. But it's vulnerable. Well, but, 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 here's my thing. When you're asking, you're the one asking. 
When people get mad at people for not reciprocating their ask, I remind them all, I'm like, you're fucking asking. Like don't look a gift horse in the mouth or whatever the saying is. I just believe there's something very powerful around expectation. If you're able to get into a place where you're just not expecting, you're only in control yourself. And so anyway, I don't know how we got there, but that's, oh, your book, yes. I Look, I think. You were pissed. I'm, honestly, I'm, I'm being dead serious with you. I, when I realized, oh my God, this person's not gonna buy it, I was in order, baffled, because he just made tens of millions of dollars. B, B, I'm being just very vulnerable and transparent, baffled. B, quickly to, I hope he's okay. Mm. To see, oh, I really don't give a shit about this. This is epic. I actually eat my own dog food. I talk about no expectation. I literally know every detail about what's happening here. And I'm not that upset about it. Fuck it, let's move on.